Should we go for one? We are rolling. Thank you. You'd do well to set aside all your partisan politics. My work is simply a means to clear the way for good people to do their jobs. Remember their name. Countermeasures. They respond to any threat to this country. And they respond brilliantly. I'm David Richardson, I'm the producer of Countermeasures. And I'm Ken Bentley, and I directed Countermeasures. And every series of Countermeasures starts with a meeting. Um, We get together with John Dorney, who's the script editor, and Matt Fitton, who's uh, one of the the main writers on it. And we sit around over coffee and just throw ideas around. We were looking at the consequences of Series 2, because Series 2 ended with Toby in disgrace, and basically being taken away for inquiry so we wanted to start series three with that inquiry well i'd wish you luck but it doesn't sound as if you're going to need it no such thing as luck gilmore we're all the fathers of our own fortune sometimes quite literally i'm hugh ross and i play sir toby kinsella he still remains um quite ambiguous. I mean, the, can we, just, we just threw something else in this morning that he was being terribly flirty with a young secretary. And uh, th- that was an aspect of him we hadn't seen before. Just It's kind of just fun finding other things to do, for, I mean, with him. But the writers have all got the, the lines are so easy to say because they now kind of absolutely understand the way Toby speaks. So kind of, they, they kind of wonderfully dry and, and edged lines. It's a great part. I wish I could do it on screen. I knew Hugh socially anyway before we came to do countermeasures. I mean, he's become a good mate away from Big Finish as well as somebody we love working Mm. with. I mean, he balances the two things of just being a really amazing actor with just being the loveliest person, doesn't he? Yeah. Alison, some distressing news has reached me concerning your father. Ah. He's been... In an accident, he's alive, but by the sounds of things, he's been through the ringer. Pity. Alison! I'm Karen Gledhill, and I play Alison Williams. Come here, you big lummox. (laughs) I know, I know, I love you too. I know I've said it before, Alison, but you really need a boyfriend. It's great being back. I've really, really enjoyed seeing everybody again and tackling some new stories. Actually, it's rather sad. I'm getting more and more caught up in it, and I take it very seriously. (laughs) Uh, In fact, they've noticed that Ken was actually calling me Alison today when we were in there. I think even he has got a little bit muddled, confused between Karen and Alison. They are fusing. Karen, we've we spent quite a lot of time with Karen, actually, because away from the studio, she's done a fair few conventions with us. Yeah, she's really thrown herself into the whole big Finnish experience. Um, So dedicated to to doing countermeasures. I mean, she's so passionate about it. Yeah. Um, and we tease her endlessly, actually. I mean, well, we tease her endlessly anyway. Um, but uh, she she she's desperate to find out what happens in series four. I mean, really desperate, isn't she? Well, you would. And we we're refusing to tell her. Yeah. So she's getting very itchy and going through the scripts over and over again, trying to find the clues to what's happening and, and picking up on all the wrong things, actually, but we haven't told her that. Of, actually, of all the actors, we're, we're cruelest to Karen, aren't we? Hmm, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you, can only do, you can only tease somebody like that when you love them to bits. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were at, right when we took her to Swansea, we did a convention in Swansea, and I, I created this, this false target of how many box sets of countermeasures I wanted her to sell and sign... Um, and said that if we didn't do that many, then we were going to write her out. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't mean a word, but it's a shocking way to behave with your actors, isn't it? <laughs> she gives as good as she gets. <laughs> yeah. It's been a real lesson, actually, meeting the, the fans of Doctor Who and, and, and Countermeasures, and particularly those of Countermeasures. Who, that now seems to have taken on a real life of its own, and people do come up and say how much they're enjoying it without 
even referencing Remembrance of the Daleks, which is nice, actually, because it means that, that it has moved into its own sort of sphere. I have the, the most enormous respect for all the people who come to these conventions. At first, I was slightly alarmed because I, I wasn't sure um, what the fan base was. I didn't know who I'd be meeting. Uh, but now I've met a lot of people several times, not not just they, they, a lot of people come to more than one convention and you meet people two or three times, maybe four. And you start to feel that you are you know, a part of their world and they're a part of yours. And their knowledge of Doctor Who and of countermeasures is actually just, I mean, it's completely spectacular and enviable and really very, very, very impressive. Um, they're very friendly, very respectful always very pleased to see you i mean you know it's nice when you, you arrive somewhere and there's a bunch of people there who are absolutely delighted to see you it doesn't happen when you're at home with your family very often so it's a really really nice experience and i look forward i hope to to doing some more in the future and meeting new people and seeing the same people again there are a lot of big unanswered questions about Alison as well with, with regards to her being a, a doctor at such a young age and we've already started to hint at her going to university at quite a young age. So I wanted to sort of pull all of those threads together a little bit and, and firm them up so that, that that backstory, which has always been a little bit vague, was was much clearer. And, and so I tried to sort of find reasons why she may have left home at quite a young age rather than just being a very intelligent young person rather than just being a child prodigy why might somebody choose to do that because as much as if somebody's clever they they, they've got the choice not to pursue that sort of career so it's really drawing all those sorts of threads together this is simon williams i play group captain ian gilmore known to his friends as chunky checkpoint charlie is around the corner Uh, probably best we don't leave you right there I doubt they are suspicious, but why take risks, yes? Yes, this will be more than adequate, thank you. Good luck. Hopefully I won't need it. It's very nice to play characters who you just slip into. I mean, the interesting thing thing that happens is the character and the actor get closer and closer over time. You can't really find the dividing line between Chunky and me. um, I'm getting more like him or he's getting more like me but I do enjoy playing him and I terribly enjoy the other three members of Countermeasures he's so Shocking. so naughty he's the, no- he's the naughtiest actor we've ever worked with in the best possible sense yeah. because he makes us cry with laughter doesn't yeah, he he's fantastic I like actors to have fun and I love actors working with actors that have fun and contribute to the having fun mm. and and he's just fantastic he's like um, uh, lighting the touch paper on a firework I'd like two versions of countermeasures I'd like the the final edited version and then all the bits in between yeah. with Simon being naughty yeah, yeah. Sam's just an outrage. He's just far too much fun. He makes me laugh a lot. What I love about working with somebody who's as um, as naughty as Simon as well is seeing how naughty they can be and still get away with it in a really charming way. Because if I tried to be that naughty, I'd get arrested. I'd just come across as a, a, um, a, as a very scary individual. Uh, but he's just brilliant. He has a quality which is, which is just delightful to sit back and, and enjoy. He is very, very naughty. He makes us all laugh a great deal. I love working with him because he's um, underneath his naughtiness. He is a true gentleman. He treats all of us with an enormous amount of respect. And he's very, very funny. I I find him absolutely delightful to work with and very much look forward to seeing him each time. Um, And in fact, actually, we've started playing Scrabble now on the internet, so (laughs) um, I guess that will keep us going until (laughs) the next time. I'm running behind already. They've called me to Sir Toby's thing. Ian, you couldn't drive me over. You've been called. Didn't they ask everyone? Oh, no. No, I don't believe they did. Karen is absolutely head girl material. She's really, I think of her as being the chief girl guide of the group. She's very good on her homework. She's very, very conscientious. And um, she's great fun. She's lovely. And, of course, I've kept in touch with her a bit over the years since we first met on in the, in the 80s when we did the Remembrance of the Daleks. She's um, She hasn't changed a bit in that time. She's still... She's still a prefect, really. She's a prefect. And um, she's quite easily shocked, which is great fun. <laughs> I think she's terribly good in the role. She's marvellous. Uh, sir? What is it? This place, it's, uh, it's 
not really cursed or anything, is it? No, it isn't. And Professor Jensen's analysis will prove that. It is an interesting thing about actors, generally, and me in particular, that sometimes nerves produce the very best in actors, and sometimes being completely relaxed produces the results. And this is a job that's so relaxed because of of, of Toby and, and you guys and the the whole ethos of the studio where we do, where we record these fantastical stories is such that you feel very free. And it's um, it's not a huge character part for me, but it's it's great to play it and it's great to, um, to see dear Gilmore slightly struggling. Probably he's getting a bit long in the tooth and he's not the sharpest knife in the box. But I enjoy playing him and I enjoy the lack of stress around the job. It, it was fascinating to read the interview that Paul Simpson did with Simon Williams on Sci-Fi Bulletin. Simon Williams is very much an actor after my own heart. I'm not an actor, but I love working with actors generally. And when, when I've heard Simon Williams talk about act, acting and the process of acting, he says a lot of the things that resonate with me. And one of the things he said, which I found um, very, very interesting, was that um, one of the things an actor looks for is what their character's contribution is to the story. And it was as I was working on The Forgotten Village. And so it, it, that, that helped enormously, actually, because I thought we've got four leads and it's very easy in a situation like that, particularly when we're telling a story that focuses on, on one character, as The Forgotten Village does, to, to f- forget about the others a little bit and, and not, not to use them in an appropriate and an effective way. Really, that made me f- concentrate on, on, on doing that and making sure every, all our four leads contributed solidly to the... Uh, the sort of development of the story and so I sort of what I what I found myself doing what the way I I think I tried to solve that was to make sure that each character took over responsibility for advancing the story to the next level and there's a very very clear build in in stakes in the in the forgotten village but it, but at each point the stakes build up to the next level it's one of the other characters that that sort of takes that it's like a relay race if you like they they sort of hand over the baton and and the next character makes the decision to um, raise the game. I think they get better and better as as the writers get to know what the actors can do. They they write more and more. They, it's like tailor made material. It's wonderful, and the stories are, you know are, are reaching back in time and forward in time. They're going all out. Wonderful, very exciting. I think this is the best series so far. I am Pamela Salem, and I play Professor Rachel Jensen. Is there anyone else you'd like to invite? No, it's just still not entirely comfortable around me, Rachel. Hmm? I feel I'm coming back to a family, my family. I actually begin to think I, I own this laboratory for real. <laughs> come to my laboratory. You come back here. This is like the lab. And um, every time I get the scripts, I think, now what happens to this lot? I really want to know what happens. I'm absolutely fascinated where it's going to go. But it does, it does feel as if we've been working together for years, which we have. <laughs> and so I'm enjoying it tremendously. Pamela Salem. Ah, she's our ray of Miami sunshine, isn't she? (laughs) Uh, Pam flies in from Miami to record countermeasures, which I take as a great compliment that she flies thousands of miles just to be with us. Um, She's she's always said that uh, doing this is very much like being with a family, and I think... It's true, isn't it? Actually, there's a really lovely family feel on doing this. Yeah, it feels the same from from um, my point of view as well. I can't, I can't. I'm sure I can speak for you actually, and say say from our point of view. She and and I think Pamela's delightful, and that that lovely energy that she carries with her, I think, um, certainly contributes enormously to making it feel like that. There's incredible calm around her as well. Yeah, so that's yeah. Kind of it's a sort of like... zen-like quality. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's, a, there's a lovely contrast, really, a complementary contrast between all of them. They all bring in their their, their own their own energy into the into the um, recording studio, and they're they're just they're so delightfully complementary that they all they all sort of fire off each other in 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 their different ways. Um, but it but it all sparkles as a result, and is is an enormous amount of fun. Yes, I think what's really nice is these characters have got more complex and deeper, I think, as the, the writers have sort of got to know our, the way we work with each other and maybe, you know, their imaginations are running riot. And um, it's become more and more interesting, you know, to, to pull these little things out. What I loved is, I mean, I, another thing was the audience is picking it all up. And even in America, some people were saying, we loved countermeasures. And I was saying, oh, that's fantastic, you know, that it's it's really obviously hitting a market and when you think they're just listening to voice 
So it's terrific that they're picking up these little nuances, and there are more this time, and hopefully more next time, and we get a we get a chance to do them, which makes it more rounded characters for me. You know, more more fulfilling to do each time. Pamela is everyone's fantasy of、um, the cool, sophisticated, no nonsense woman who everybody really rather wants to to make her laugh or or ruffle her hair a bit. She's got this icy, cool, efficient quality that comes from a, a, a wonderfully articulate voice. She's a joy to work with, and of course, in real life, she's completely giggly and lovely. I adore Simon, except that all my makeup runs when I'm working with Simon. He makes us laugh so much. Then you go and say, "Have some photographs taken," and we have to rush to the ladies to put our makeup back on again because he is a natural wit, Simon. He really is, as you know. He made us laugh all those years ago, and I, he makes us laugh even more now. He gets away with murder now. He gets away with more murder than he used to. Don't know how he does it. I'm trying to learn the trick. <laughs> So that's Simon for you, and he lifts my spirits to work with him. Well, Pamela is just the most unchanging person. It's extraordinary. Every year I see her, and even from when I worked with her all those many years ago, she just doesn't seem to change. She's so gracious and thoughtful. There's something almost regal about her. I think I find her very generous, very easy, easy to work with.、Um, has I think also completely inhabits the character of Rachel. And we both love dogs, so that helps. She's lovely. She hasn't changed in all these years. It makes me sick. <laughs> she looks the same. <laughs> she's, she's, she feel. I feel as if it's she was at the time. You know, I said、um, she's very lucky that、um, she looks really as she did, and it's just as much fun playing with her. Now I begin to feel a bit like her grandmother instead of her. <laughs> Um, but it's lovely to be reunited with her, and but it really does feel like the gap between our ages has become bigger because she looks so young. Guard, this man is a spy. No, he is trying to smuggle vital information out of the country. Rachel, no. Is this true? He's hardly going to admit it. No. Hands in the air. Rachel, please. Pamela is extremely bright, extremely hardworking, and sometimes worries a little too much, but then. You can tease her, and she gets over it very quickly. Well, Hugh, of course, I didn't know till this series, and、um, well, he's much nicer than the boss <laughs> in the series. I love him dearly. He, we've we've now done some travelling together. You get to know each other on travels. He actually, I, I feel much fonder towards him than I do to my boss in the story. <laughs> so we don't know where the story may lead us, of course. We talk about the blending of characters. I think we're all sort of slightly ad- adopting. Traits of our own characters, so I think Hugh likes to play on this sort of inscrutability that <laughs> Toby Kinsella has. I've been to see him in a couple of plays since the last series, and I thought before we even started on Countermeasures that he was the most wonderful actor. He really is, and so experienced, and he never really stops working. So I remember being very excited that he was going to be part of Countermeasures as the member of the team that I'd not met before. And he's delightful. He's also quite naughty, but he does it in a much more subtle way than Simon. So it's almost worse. And he did set us off the other day. I'm not going to repeat what he said, but it did set us off for quite a long time. I could listen to that voice all day long, and I, I look sometimes to the left. He's always in a booth to the left, and there's always a little twinkle in his eye. He's very dry. He's a he's a, a wonderful actor, and he's got the that beautiful voice, and.、Um, Is something slightly sinister in the beauty of the way he speaks. I, I'm, I'm sure when we decide to wrap up the the series after about ten seasons, we'll find that he has been a double agent all along somehow. And he's a wonderful actor. I got a chance to see last time he came over. He was doing a play at the Finbar, and I went to see him. It was such a privilege. And so、um, you got a good bunch. Are you the real Kenny White? <coughs> <sighs> That would be telling. My name is Ben Bishop, and I play Kenny, one of the many Kennys. You're barred. Anyway, I thought you was inside. Nah, that's me brother. How'd you get past Harry and Freddy? They're being dealt with. Stupid, stupid kid. Initially, when I read it, I was rather confused. I didn't 
quite get to grips with it so I had to read it a few times and it's incredibly dark incredibly fun incredibly <laughs> uh, dramatic and playing something that has morphed themselves into many of the identical human being and being able to telepathically communicate from one person to another is nothing but fun the only way to play lots of variations of the same person is to find different moods and making a note of where the person is coming from or has arrived from or is situated so the atmosphere in which they can be caught in as well um, I think if you start changing the voice to play the same person it's impossible so you have to maintain the same voice in different moods I think is the only way to uh, to portray it. almost like it's uh, uh, a personality disorder I think that's the only way to describe it isn't it amazing what you can find out from a lady's handbag have I been here all night? Can't take your drink. Not when it's been drugged, no. I'll have one of us make a coffee. He is quite hard-nosed, and yet I like to stick up for every character that I play. I think he's important to. I think it's important to uh, do that. And he's quite charismatic. He's, his charm is not uh, to everybody's taste, but I can see why maybe the odd Essex girl might be attracted to an Essex boy. Who, who has those sort of features um, and that sort of personality. So no, he's probably not to everybody's type, but there must be something likeable about him because he's incredibly fun to play. So that's the only way I can say, that's the only way I can describe him really. He's not the sort of person I'd like to meet, but uh, he's definitely the sort of person I like to play. Richard Hope playing William Heaton, Tory politician. You can go back to work, Tobias. I beg your pardon? It's been granted. Have a good day, Sir Toby. Thank you for bearing with us for all this unpleasantness. Heaton is quite a devious character because you're not quite sure to start with if he's on the side of uh, Tobias or not because he keeps using his Christian name. But he is an arch politician, somebody who sits on the fence and plays both sides, the one off, off the other, to finding the best position for himself. So to play that sort of part is really interesting when you do it because... As an audience, you won't quite know where he is, or you think you know he's against Tobias, and then gradually you'll learn that he's thinking about it, or in fact the whole thing's contrived, and he's set other things up. So in fact he's after his own position. Sir Toby, this is your opportunity. You may now address the committee on your own behalf. Then we shall retire to consider how we move forward. Thank you. I don't propose to defend myself. I can see from the evidence presented in the line of questioning pursued that certain conclusions have already been drawn. Tobias, please. This is an independent inquiry. It is that... my turn to speak, is it not? It's like a little family, and you have to trust the other actors you're working with. And it's very quick, and often it's things that are done in one take, because you have to rely on a sort of instinct to where you're going with the story and how it's written, and who you're working with. In countermeasures, I've worked, I've got a shorthand with um, Hugh Ross, because I've worked with him in a play at the National. And that immediately, you, you feel very comfortable with the people. You're comfortable with the crew, the engineer, the director. That all helps to making you feel that you can dare a bit more, and you push your performance. Whereas if you were in a normal studio, or say something with a uh, play for today, or that sort of thing, or a, everybody makes you very nervous, because you have to be so precise. and. Um, that's why it's interesting doing big finish stuff. I love it. Episode two, the plan was for it to be a very standard episode of Countermeasures with the team back together doing what they do. And, um, yeah, back to business as usual. Interestingly, for episode two, we started off with another storyline. Um, we had a different writer on that episode and Justin came in on the concrete cage relatively late in the process. The episode that would have been our episode two in this series will actually now appear in series four. As much as series three being about um, resolving the situation we found ourselves at at the end of series two, it, it was also about what happens next, what we set up next. And it's very much, we're very much starting to introduce the long game. And what we found with episode two is the first episode two we were looking at fitted much more into series four and what our long-term, longer-term plans are um, for the series and, and the characters. And we needed something that was a, a, a little bit more business as usual for, for episode two. We needed something that was a little bit more standalone. I'm Justin Richards, and I'm the writer of Countermeasures, The Concrete Cage. 
I wrote the uh, final episode of series one of Countermeasures, uh, which was great fun, so I was more than happy to do another one. Had a rest for series two, probably because uh, other people needed to go, <laughs> or I was busy with something else, uh, like Jago and Lightfoot, most likely. But now we're with series three, and it's, it's great to be back. Look, we really do need to get you out of here until we know the place is safe. You ain't evacuating me, young man. Sorry? If I die, it'll be by my own fireside. This... this isn't right. It can't be. Nothing that Mr. Isler can do is going to force me out of my own home. And I know you're game too, young man. I saw you. I'll report you. Who are you? Why are you here? What's going on? I'm dreaming. I'm hallucinating. Things have moved on a little bit for the characters, which is interesting. Series one story that I did was quite broad in its scale and, uh, um, and in terms of where the action takes place. So I went for something rather different for, for this one, which is much more contained. It's, uh, it's not quite in a single building, but, uh, but it's very much focused on a single building. So it was, it was a nice, nice contrast. The real thing is to do with how credible the characters are in the original episodes. And that's partly down to the scripting of those characters. It's a lot down to who played the roles and, and how they performed them. And a lot of it's down to the to the story itself, almost irrespective of those characters and the and the world that those characters inhabit. It's interesting that Countermeasures and Jago and Lightfoot are both set in the past. They're both set in London, which is quite a wide canvas, or, or largely set in London. But both Remembrance of the Daleks and Talons of Wayne Chiang give you a large and and deep landscape within which the story takes place. Now I think that has a lot to do with it. It means that the characters in the story are all are all grounded in reality much more than it's not fair to single out a particular story, but but more superficial stories that Doctor Who occasionally does, where people sort of turn up and go, and you don't you don't really get the depth of society. It's partly because they're in the real world as well. If it's often another planet, then you don't tend to get that depth. I think I can't imagine doing a, a spin-off series based on uh, a couple of characters from Time Lash, for example. Um, no disrespect to Time Lash, but just because the we don't know enough about the society in which it's set. Having the mix is important as well, obviously, in the way they play off each other. And with Jago and Lightfoot 2, there it's more to do with contrasting characters and outlooks. Here it's it's to do largely with, um, well, at its most basic, with their professions and their areas of expertise that uh, that are sort of um, complementary and, and and overlapping. But they have... Um, They've been brought together much more formally in countermeasures in that they're, they're a team that's been put together to deal with things. Uh, and that gives you a bit of added tension because these people sort of have to get on even though they otherwise might not, which is uh, a bit like Blake 7, I suppose. It's people put together not through any direct choice of their own. I think in countermeasures it's probably easier to resign, but <laughs> without dying... <laughs> Are you suggesting the place really is haunted? It does seem a little far-fetched. Cooper killed himself yesterday and it's a full moon tonight. Oh, for goodness sake. No, no, look, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just pointing out that... A coincidence, that's all. Are you sure? It was nice to do a, something that's, in effect, a ghost story, but but isn't. Because <laughs> Countermeasures doesn't do ghost stories. Everything's based in science. Uh, you can be a bit more woolly in something like um, Jago and Lightfoot with your explanations. But, uh, but so part of the challenge was, was finding uh, a, a credible way of explaining away what is, what is in effect, a, a, a mystery with ghosts. I'd suggested we did a story about dementia and also we'd thrown around the idea of doing a story where the team go undercover in a foreign country to try and retrieve something, so that became Dawney's episode four. And you were always in the running to write one, weren't you? We'd, we'd, we'd been talking for ages that you should write an episode for something we do, and Countermeasures was your first. Yeah, it sort of came along, and uh, the, the, the sort of window of opportunity opened up on, on series three of Countermeasures. Yeah, 
Um, it, it, it was a bit of a toss-up as to where it fell. I, I, I know for a long time we, we weren't sure whether it was going to be episode two or three. They were almost interchangeable um, for a long time in the process, and, and it was only until we were clearer on the through line of, of series three and what we wanted to do going into series four that we knew where it would fall. But yeah, it was, it was nice to get the opportunity to actually finally be able to sit down and do that. It's as if everything we do is determined by our genes and there's nothing anyone can do to change anyone. I've tried. I've spent years studying and learning and searching and trying and I don't know what else to do. I need you to tell me. I need you to tell me what I should do and if there's nothing anyone can do, then I need you to tell me that. To put your arms around me and give me a hug and tell me there's nothing anyone can do and that it'll be all right. Please. Daddy, please. Really, it was it was your idea, it was Richardson's idea, that we should be doing a story that uh, focuses very much more on the personal life and or backstory of one of our lead characters. You were keen to have a much more personal story and you were keen for that story to include dementia in some way. So from that point, really, it was a toss-up as to who we gave that story to, which character we felt fitted into that sort of basic mould that we had. And, and what sort of story we then went on to tell. For me, it seemed that, that Alison was a natural choice. There, there are some characters that are good to keep on kicking, and, it, and, and it's meant in a positive way with regards to storytelling because that, that's the stuff of drama, what, what characters find themselves faced with um, and how they deal with those situations. And Alison had already had a lot to deal with. We've, we've put her through quite a lot, and, and she's had a very interesting journey. She's got a very interesting journey to come because of where that character fits in, the age of that character in, in this time, in, the, in the, the early to mid-60s. So it just felt right to me that she was the one we should throw a few more rocks at. Hello, I'm Derek Carlyle, and I'm playing Corporal Millard and Sam Caddick. Problems? Millard? Yes, sir. There seems to be a considerable amount of what we can only describe as atmospheric interference, sir. Uh, radio communications are poor. We're struggling to get a frequency that will carry any real distance. Radar's all over the place. We're doing everything we can, but no luck so far. Press on regardless. Hey, group captain? Well, I was, I was fortunate within this that we decided to make the various different um, soldier characters into uh, the one character, Corporal Millard. Uh, and that certainly made my life a lot easier. Um, and uh, just given um, the drama of some of his scenes um, and uh, his basic efficiency, I, I, I decided on, a, on a, a confident and decisive, strong character, a bit rough around the edges and, uh, uh, you know, suitably sort of grizzled as a soldier. And then, the, by contrast, Sam Caddick, uh, in my head, was quite youthful and naive and uh, um, just, a sim dare I say, a simple country boy. And just fun to have, you know, those two pretty different characters to play in the space of one day, really. Cheerio, Miss Williams. Goodbye, Mr... Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Bevan. Goodbye, Mr Bevan, and thank you. Not at all. Hope he, um... Yes. Well, God bless. My name is Graham Seed, and I play the local vet, Mr Bevan. Well, it's quite exciting... Um, I feel rather sorry for Mr. Bevan. He's treated as a doctor, and he isn't a doctor. And uh, he's quite a sensitive soul, and uh, he's stuck in this mayhem of hell that's going around him. And I don't want to spoil the story for anyone, but it comes to a rather an unfortunate sticky end. It's the most relaxed job. It's A lot of actors talk about fun, but um, there's such a camaraderie and such a wealth of talent in the studio that you're encouraged um, to relax and pitch your performance bravely. I think that's a polite way of putting it. And making instant decisions is always good. It's Rupert Evans. I play Jack Maddox. Say it. No. Say it! I still have feelings for you, Alison Williams. Well, we'd better do something about that, hadn't we? 
don't start something you're not prepared to finish. Jack Maddox, particularly, I, I, I like because of his interaction with, with Alison and their past and characters with, with a real sense of character and past, which this one has, um, his affiliation with, you know, childhood sweetheart of Alison living in this village and her coming back and him sort of always, always having feelings for her and, 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 and sort of following, although unbeknownst to her, sort of him have following her to Cambridge, although she didn't know that, and him getting caught up in in this sort of uh, the underworld of uh, espionage, which is, you know, becomes apparent, is, is something that really intrigued me. So I, I, I really enjoyed the character and loved the story, and so I just, uh, I'm very lucky to be a part of it. Blimey, what's that smell? A calf, or what's left of it. I don't know how you can stand it. Don't know how I could stand you, but I did. Are you ever going to give me a break? Not unless it's your nose. One of the great things about audio and, and story, you know, plays and radio is that you can create a, a, and do a story in a very short amount of time. In a day, you can, you know, tell a whole story and the speed of that is, is, is great because you interact with many, many different actors all in one day and you get to do different things. You're both indoors sometimes, outdoors, running in cars, up hills, over grass, you know, so it's, it's, it's completely varied. And, that's, and that, ver that variety is, is something that uh, keeps, keeps us actors interested and, and keeps, keeps it being sort of something that you become passionate about, about creating those stories in a quick and hopefully concise manner. I adore doing audio stories and radio plays, probably more than any other, actually, any other kind of genre for me, because you can tell a story very quickly. Um, invariably, the writing's, you know, really good, and there's, um, you can sort of create a mini play within each scene. I try to create a mini story. Each scene has a little story in itself, and, then, and if you can connect those mini stories, then you create the whole play, and you do that, you know, in a day. Um, and you travel the world within that day. You can be, you know, in, in a village in Wales to you know, somewhere in London or outer space. And it's wonderful because you can travel in your head and, in, and, and through the play. So it's, it's a really versatile, a really versatile format for me and something that I, uh, I hope people love as much as I do. I missed you, you know. What was it like going to university at such a young age? I felt at home. I could talk about important things with people who could hold a conversation instead of all of you. Thanks. I ended up going to Cambridge too. I heard they let anyone in these days. It's no wonder you never had any friends at school. You've got to be one of the most heartless, shegocentric. I said shut up! I played John Myers in Hellboy. And what, similar to this actually, what interests me about Hellboy is that it it derived from um, a comic book, so it was um, something, I mean, not this, because this is obviously, you know, an audio piece, but in terms of something other, Hellboy was something that was um, a graphic novel, it started, and then transposed to film. I loved being a part of that, because again, like this, um, the director, Guillermo del Toro, had such incredible imagination, and the script and the movie itself sort of went to so many different places and, and, um, and, and imagine, imaginative creatures, which I think this, this sort of has as well, and great ideas, and uh, sl slightly sort of outer-worldly outer ideas, which I, I loved. And so things which, which have wonderful and wondrous creatures and, and stuff is something that I particularly um, enjoy and want, want to be a part of, because you can really kind of, uh, you know, enjoy yourself and... and and, and it's fun to have those those sort of uh, you know aliens and all those things around because it's you know that's it's slightly different. I'm Tim Bentink and I play Mr. Mr. Williams and uh, the reporter Curtis and Comrade Kowalskin and in another episode I'm uh, Reggie Cray or Ronald Cray, one of them. Oh, I'm not sure which. Well, both of them probably. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done to yourself, eh? Been in the wars, have you? Wouldn't take me. No, I just meant... Oh, forget it. Uh, who are you, anyway? Daddy, it's me, Alison. Uh. You must remember your own daughter. Well, the thought process was that um, I saw the name Williams and then of the vet, played by the redoubtable Graham Seed, was, was Bevan. So I thought there might be a Welsh hint to it. 
Um, so I, and also because I was a farmer rounding up cows, of course, being um, again identifiable as David, that, that we had to make him very different from David Archer rounding up cows, who's got a very specific way of doing it. So I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd make him as sort of Welsh, you know, and um, then they said, no, not, not, not quite as Welsh as that, because I actually have got uh, a. a, 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 a my niece married a Welshman, so uh, I've been picking up things. In fact, I've learned how to say Clan Verpul Gwyn Githgo Gerich Wyn Drobach Lantis especially for this production. But no, they've brought him back a bit. But now the poor chap is um, suffers from dementia, and um, a personal experience of that with relations who've done that, so it's a very sad state to be in. So the man's a tragic figure and, um, and lovely to play, and um, a contrast to the rather brash and nasty Curtis who's trying to inveigle his reportering nose into everything. By the time I finished doing big finished productions I will have played every sort of character that you, that you can possibly be and and have died when I, I just basically get employed by big finish to, to die across uh, uh, to die a lot but uh, one of the joys of, of doing it today is uh, working again with with Graham Seed who um, those of you who um, ever listen to the Archers might recognise that I'm David, and indeed there is Graham, um, and for um, all intents and purposes, we are still up on the roof, and there is Nigel Pargeter, still alive. I haven't seen him actually since I did push him off the roof. <laughs> so it's great to see him in, in good health and hale and hearty. <laughs> this is the first time we've worked together since he pushed me off the roof. I say pushed me off the roof, he didn't really, but... A lot of listeners out there of the Archers think that he did push me off the roof and um, I'm um, wary to be in the studio with him. You know, to be working with David Archer is just... I, I can't quite believe it. I have to keep sort of putting myself, my feet firmly back on the ground and, and also with Nigel. And I was very upset when, when Nigel departed from the Archers, as were many people. I went on strike for a while, didn't listen to it. Um, but I do listen to it and I, I am a huge fan and it's an absolute honour to be working with them and they're very, very good. Tim and myself re really rather grew up in the programme together. We met in our early 20s. Well, I was 60 before my sad, untimely death. I don't write very often, so I was expecting and would have been happy to have done any, any amount of rewrites um, in order to make it work. The only reason I wasn't is because I'm, I'm, I was very, very lucky with this. Uh, uh, we've already done two series of countermeasures, so we were working with four very, very talented actors who created these four lead characters and have spent two series showing me I I exactly uh, how these characters think and speak and work and how they respond to situations and what their choices are in given situations. So, so really, uh, it, it was almost as if all four of them were with me while I was writing it. Their voices were very, very clear in my head as I was writing it. And so I think given that we've already, we've already produced eight hours of drama with, with these, these four fantastic characters, I would have been disappointed with myself if I'd not known their voices clearly if I'd not been able to, to capture the essence of their of their voices but equally it, it's such a, a gift of a position to be in as a writer because David's going to read the script and he's going to tell me what works and what doesn't John Dawn is going to read the script as script editor he's going to tell me what works and what doesn't and then of course once we're in the studio four of the greatest actors you could hope to work with are, are going to be bringing it to life and they're going to tell me if I've got it wrong they know these characters if, if anything's um, if a, any line is inappropriate or any moment in the story is inappropriate they, they'd stop me and they'd tell me I didn't realise it was Ken Bentley's first script. It's absolutely brilliant. I have to say, I haven't come across countermeasures before. It's a, a whole new thing for me, so it's a bit of a learning experience. But it's um, it's you know it's non-stop action, and um, and, and fantastically well written. And I'm I'm very much looking forward to hearing the whole thing put together it, it, with its with all the effects on. Because as you probably know, we kind of do it in isolation, and so we never kind of hear the the full thing put together until we get sent the, the CDs at the end of it when we finally dis discover what the, the whole thing's about. I mean, having read it, obviously, you can see how, it's, um, how it will and you kind of imagine it, but it's not until you hear the, the finished thing that you really get the full effect. I think it's great. And congratulations to Ken. It's kind of very English pastoral, in a way, the kind of thing of this village in Oxfordshire, wherever it was, being sort of having the, its problems. A bit of... Uh, 
alien invasion. No, it was, no, it was, uh, it was a very nice script. It was thrilling to get a script through by Mr Bentley, and uh, as much as it galls me to say it, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it as well. It's an exciting piece, it's got great pace, I think, and great humour, which is surprising, because Ken hasn't got much of a sense of humour at the best of times. But, <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the concept and the, and the, and the, um, the situation, and uh, I thought it ripped along nicely. I particularly like... The, uh, the humour at the beginning of uh, scenes where you come in halfway through a conversation and you just hear the punchline of a joke. I think Ken put some naughty ones in there and I, I enjoyed those. I'm really impressed actually. We're actually in the middle of it now and I was a little bit nervous about it because it's slightly different from some of the other storylines that we've been following. But I'm really enjoying it and I think he writes extremely well for us as characters. Yes, it's a very interesting journey for me. She knew she'd let you down, you know. But it was my fault she couldn't have more. If I hadn't been so difficult to... She'd have had as many as it took until she could give you a boy. I'm sorry I broke her. I wanted to fix her. I keep trying to find ways to... But you can't fix people, Daddy. You can't change them. Some things are explained about Alison in this episode which will help me in the future as well. And it's been, I found it actually quite touching. Yeah, it's a, it, is a, it is a little unusual, but I'm really enjoying doing it and I hope, it, hope the episode works out well. The whole thing is a very, very pleasant experience, I have to say. I'm extremely lucky. Hello, I'm John Dorney. I am the script editor of Countermeasures and I wrote uh, the fourth episode of Series 3, Unto the Breach. Appearances, Suzanne. And Schrodinger. You are Herr Cornwell, uh, and this is your lovely wife. Um, He's not sure I'm lovely. I can be a bit of a battle axe at times. The aim with the third series was largely from my perspective. I I tend not to like series kind of doing a big sort of game-changing event at the end of a series and then dropping it as quickly as possible and getting back to the status quo in the the first episode of the next series. I wanted to sort of deal with the repercussions and slightly long-terming thinking in those terms um so that there's at least in the first episode a vague sense of it almost feeling like it's back to normal but clearly with a few dangling loose ends and and plot threads that are left to be picked up and it just develop the characters really i suppose take the move the characters on uh take them through to new and different places and just keep exploring them and pushing them really. My brief on Unto the Breach was uh, to do something that was a little bit like Argo. Uh, We were uh, talking about that for a while, or saw the film, really enjoyed the film. And because it's the 60s, that naturally led me to the Berlin Wall in East Berlin and it just felt a very, very 60s thing. One thing I'd slightly been disappointed with when I wrote Sins of the Fathers but then really was happy about when I did the Assassination Games was that I think the more 60s you can make the story, more emphatically 60s you can make the story, the better it is for countermeasures. Sins of the Fathers, I felt, whilst I, I was perfectly happy with the script, didn't feel massively, massively rooted in the 60s. So that led to me thinking in terms of East Germany. And then just went off and watched lots of films and read up on, on the period. So I watched you know, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold and Funeral in Berlin and various books, just to get a vague sense of what, what the world was like at the time and what was going on uh, in East Germany then and indeed West Germany. And, and just play around with it. I, I always think that the, the key idea in my head was this notion of, of a sort of defecting alien. Um, even though, as it eventually turns out to be, not an alien. It, the idea of a fake-out alien invasion quite appealed to me. They manufactured an alien plot to lure us here, but it was just a sideshow, a distraction from their real plan. Getting a British subject under their control. We sort of nominally put that in, in our initial discussions about a year ago, as story three. There are elements of that in story three, and I kind of realised when I was thinking about it a bit that that was possibly more useful in mine. I think it gave them a really good reason to get in, but didn't change too much of the ethos of the series, really. I think, I think we tried to sort of keep alien incursions to a limited degree within countermeasures. I think uh, it, it can't be too much of that without becoming a different series. And then I, I got kind of interested in various mind control things. I'd been watching a lot of the TV series Dollhouse, 
uh, Joss Whedon's quite interesting, if often regarded as not wholly successful, series uh, from a few years ago that I really rather liked. And it got some interesting ideas about identity and mind control and and what people know about what they're doing. And, uh, and I kind of wanted to include some elements of that so that there are people who are traitors but they don't realise they're traitors and they're not actually behaving in that way. Yeah, that was all the things that kind of went into the melting pot. I am uh, George Layton and I'm playing Stefan Lehner who is described as our man in Germany or in Berlin. Very interesting character. <laughs> I will drive the crew captain to the border. Much obliged. Then, Sir Toby, I will take you to the filing office. An exciting afternoon of rifling through cabinets awaits us. I can hardly contain my enthusiasm. It's sort of James Bondish with a lot more charm. It seems to me. I I, I like it. I think it's it's it's, uh, it's sort of a little bit sort of um, kind of oldie worldy to me. I, I I love it. I think it's got a sort of a a nice Cold War feel about it. And uh, and, and, I, and I think the the acting, from what I've heard, are fantastic. I'm really enjoying it. I was very lucky. I've done uh, all these sort of things we can call classics, like the, you know, uh, Z cars. I was in the very early Z cars. Ken Loach was the director I worked with. He looked like the office boy. But, but the big break for me was getting into Doctor in the House for two reasons. One, I always felt my strength were in comedy, and it was a pretty well a groundbreaking series. And then I became with Jonathan Lynn, mainstream writers of that series, and. I eventually wrote myself out and went straight into Aiden Alfred Mama. Sort of wrote myself out, left on the Friday and was in Aiden Alfred Mama on the Monday. And that's how my writing career started. In a way, my writing took over and I started losing work because I had to start turning work down. I've had a very nice balanced career combining acting and writing, but now I don't do very much writing at all. I did Doctor Who. I've never really sort of exploited it enough, I don't think, because it's such a cult now, and I've sort of missed out a bit, but I, I played Navigator Pen at the controls in about 1969 in the, the Troughton period of Doctor Who, a serial called The Space Pirates. Uh, I remember some of the actors, of course Fraser was in it, Wendy Padbury, Patrick Troughton, who's lovely, Jack May, who then went to be Nelson Gabriel in The Archers, he was in it, was a very sonorous, resonant voice, Jack May, uh, Brian Peck, I remember, Dudley Foster, Dudley Foster. My son had just been born, and he's now f nearly 45, so it shows how long ago that was. Yeah. But it was a time when my first child was born, and I'd, I'd got a house, my first house, with this huge mortgage of £32 a month. And I thought, oh, God, I'm out of work. How will I pay my mortgage? And then suddenly Michael Hart, the director, booked me without even seeing me and I got oh, six or oh, I think six episodes of Doctor Who and the Space Pirates. It was fantastic. My name is Philip Pope and I'm playing Templeton. Here he is. I'll let you cover the introductions. If either of you need anything, ring the bell. Hello. I'm Alison, apparently. What's your name? Call me Templeton. Templeton is a civil servant, but he's a bit of an oily rag. He's not the sort of cuddly, lovable civil servants that we've come to know and love on our TV screens. He's not a sort of Sir Humphrey or anyone like that um, in uh, Yes, Prime Minister. He's, he's someone who he's a bit two-faced and um, he's, he claims that he's doing everything for the, for the good of the country, but you suspect that actually this a different agenda going on and he makes himself slightly unpopular to say the least. What did I say this morning? Was it good morning Professor Jensen? Did you sleep well? No, I give up. What did I say about every decision, every action being cleared with me first? It's a role which is which is great and you know baddies are always good fodder for actors. I mean I'm probably more used to doing comedy stuff um, anyway so to so to get a role which is not only a sort of you don't have to make people laugh but you can actually sort of enjoy <laughs> being a piece of work is 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 a great gift so i'm really enjoying it but i mean he's he's quite sort of he's quite underplayed but he's um, you know he's not sort of he's not a pantomime villain you know he's just someone who gets on with his job but actually he's he's just not very nice it's always good to have a bit of light and shade 
Hello, my name's Toby Longworth, and I'm... <laughs> oh, that's a good point. I've just forgotten his name. Uh, Weber wasn't his name. No, it's Verma. Werner. Werner is his name. Sorry, I thought it was Weber. It's a long story. I've had a long week. I do hope the group captain manages to avoid the troops, too. It would add authenticity, but it hardly matters. We are home and dry. No loose ends. Ah. Are there? Uh... There are. I was going to say I, I'm a bit of a Cold War buff. But having thought I was a Doctor Who buff and then met real Doctor Who buffs, I, uh, I'm a bit shy of saying that in the future. So I quite like the Cold War and the concept of uh, the Ipcrest file and Tinker Taylor soldier spy and Smiley's people and that whole atmosphere of a cloak and dagger and, and um, you know friends across the sea. I think perhaps if things were different, we would have been friends, you and I. I love that kind of atmosphere and it, has, it reeks of that. Um, and I found that particularly delightful. Like a lot of Cold War stories, that's one of the things I really love about it. I mean, it's, it's, it also has that quality of uh, the Cold War where no one's quite who they seem and everybody's shifting allegiances. And I quite like the idea that you start off, my character, you start off thinking he's, he's one guy. Well, in fact, actually, the very first scene, you, you, you're not, you think he's a baddie and then you think, oh, he's a goodie. And then you think, oh, no, he's a baddie. And, oh, no, he's a lunatic game from the planet. You, you just basically get to... He shifts shapes. It's not easy to say. Just in, as much as the Cold War story is about sh shape shifting, just as much as the Alien Strand is about shape shifting, I like that. And why? Just wait till you find why? out. Just yeah, but it's going to be another year, year isn't it, before yeah. we find out? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not going to tell you. Mm. Who's yeah. writing it? Who's writing it? <laughs> Keeping us all on tenterhooks. <laughs> well, I, I'm yes, I'm a little bit upset about <laughs> about what's happened to her. I can only hope that there's going to be an, another series so that uh, we can find out a little more about what's actually happened because it's not entirely clear what happens to Alison at the end of episode three, and it's even less clear about what's actually occurred at the end of episode four. I don't know what's wrong with her. <laughs> There clearly is something still wrong with her, and I just hope that they're going to make her better. What? What's happening? Where am I? Just relax, Miss Williams. What are you going to do to me? Nothing of import. Merely implanting a few electrodes in your brain. What? It sounds worse than it is. And you're doing this to me? Me? Oh, heaven for friend. I hardly possess the necessary skill. I'm simply here in an observatory capacity. You'll be dealt with by wonderful surgeons. I will? Yes. Good men and true. Well, this series leaves us with a cliffhanger, really. This is the first time we've been doing these when we know full well we've got a fourth series. And that meant that I, I could end the series in a slightly different place. I, think I, I, hadn't, I don't think we'd actually talked about it ending on a cliffhanger. I just got to be writing the synopsis and got through it and was getting towards the end and was just thinking, there is no way I can tie this all off in the time I've got left without it being a massive anti-climax. And so I just thought, well, let's just write myself into a corner and see what what where that leads me. I think it just was getting too big and I'm thinking, it's got to be a cliffhanger. And I thought, I'll send that through, through to the guys and see what they think. And fortunately, everyone was willing to go for it. I quite excited to see where we've got. We've got some ideas. We kind of know where it's going. I'm kind of looking forward to finding out how it's all resolved as well anyway, so that should be fun. I do consider ourselves to be very, very lucky at Big Finish. We, we work with, with um, delightful people. We've got four incredibly talented actors who are also amongst the nicest people you could ever hope to meet and spend any time with, and we get to do uh, series after series with them mm. and, and have as much fun. We're having as much fun on the, the final day of recording Series 3 as we did on the, the first day of Series 1. It was really sad, actually, when you come to the last day, isn't it, and you think, oh, we're not going to be doing this for another year. Yeah, we're not going to see them for another year. I have to say, we've been so busy in the last year that it, it, it does only feel like last month since we saw them all. It's, a, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic.